So we're going to read about liberation tonight. Yeah? So, but before we do that, we're going to imagine the um, merit field and the space in front of us. The Buddha surrounded by all the other Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, lineage lamas, and so on. And then ourselves surrounded by all sentient beings, bugs and bears and lambs and mice and cougars. We think about them all in human form and we want to lead them to take refuge in the Buddha Dharma Sangha and to listen to the teachings with the motivation of bodhicitta. to expand the meaning of your life from just having pleasure and protecting yourself and the people that you care about. Expand your mind to think of the happiness and misery of your friends, too, and strangers. and even the people you don't like or the people you're afraid of. So expand our awareness of sentient beings' experience in a very broad way. And see that no matter who we are or what species we are, what realm we're born into. At the end of the day, deep in our own hearts, all we want is to be happy and safe and to be free of any kind of dukkha, any kind of uh, difficult situations. So since we're all alike in that way, let's expand our heart to care about everybody, and especially do seek full awakening so that we can help them follow the path to liberation and have all the cooperative conditions to be able to do so. So with that kind of feeling of uh, similarity, and deep understanding of others just because of our basic wish. Then let's listen to the teachings and share the Dharma this evening. Okay, 
So last week we were uh, continuing in samsara, nirvana, and Buddha nature, and we were talking about uh, the purified aspect or the transcendental aspect of dependent origination. Okay, and so uh, there are eleven links here, but we start out in samsara and then we have to find the link to go over to the path that goes towards liberation. And that link um, starts with birth, yeah, and goes, because we're born, then there's dukkha, unsatisfactory conditions. And because we have dukkha, when we're uh, fortunate enough to meet the Buddhist teachings, then, uh, and if we have a store of good karma so that our mind isn't too obscured, um, we can see the benefit of those teachings and it generates faith in us. Yeah, so knowing that if we practice them, uh, we can make progress. So there we go from dukkha, what is usually translated as suffering, but suffering's not a good translation. We go from dukkha to having faith. So we cross over from samsara's links to the transcendental links. Yeah, But with faith, we're still an ordinary being. Okay, Usually transcendental means uh, for the aryas, but here... Uh, it's transcendental in that it's leading, leading us to be an Arya, somebody who's realized uh, the ultimate nature directly, uh, is leading us there, but we're still not on the transcendental links. Okay, so faith, yeah, when we start learning the teachings, and remember, faith does not mean blind faith. It's based on understanding. It's based on our using our investigative prob- uh, pr- um, abilities to, to examine something and see if it's true, to try the teachings out. Okay, so it's not blind faith. But when we have faith or trust, I think trust is... I don't know, in many ways I like the word trust or confidence in much better than faith because faith always reminds me of I believe, but you know, when you don't really. Um, yeah, but when I think of confidence or trust, it's a much deeper kind of uh, relationship. Okay, so confidence, trust, faith, however you want to call it. It is the proximate cause for delight. Okay, so um, the delight is the delight in having far- found the Dharma, okay, and having um, no beginning to know about the three higher trainings, and especially uh, beginning with the higher training in ethical conduct, yeah which to translate that into ordinary terms means getting our act together or stop being a jerk, okay? Because when we act without ethical conduct and in the opposite way to it, um, we're really making ourselves into big jerks. And uh, yeah, And people don't trust us. We don't feel comfortable in our own skin. Uh, And, of course, it creates all kinds of hindrances for future lives and for practicing the path. Okay? So delight is, you know, comes with keeping good ethical conduct. And when we have good ethical conduct, then we don't feel so guilty. We don't have so much remorse because we haven't done anything that is against our values and principles. So it brings a certain kind of confidence, a certain kind of uh, even trust in ourselves, you could say. 
then that delight from practicing ethical conduct, which also brings a lot of self-confidence, yeah, that we can manage our life, we can manage our body, speech, and mind. So that delight I'm reviewing here is the uh, proximate cause for joy. So joy is one of the factors that arises when we engage in concentration, which is the second of the three higher trainings. So here we're, uh, we do all the practices uh, to develop single-pointedness, you know, a mind that can stay on its object for as long as uh, we want without getting distracted. Yeah, but being able to concentrate is a tool. It's not the end of the line. Yeah, so we're still in samsara. We haven't realized emptiness. So uh, there's no liberation just in that. Yet, on the other hand, it's something essential for the path. We can't do without it. So that joy... Um, from starting to develop concentration uh, be- is the proximate cause for pliancy. Yeah, actually the joy doesn't necessarily come at the beginning of developing concentration. It often comes much later, but it is the cause for pliancy because when the mind is very joyful, then it becomes much more flexible. It's not so rigid, okay? And the pliancy is, uh, can be mental pliancy and it can be physical pliancy. Um, we need both. With the physical pliancy, then we can sit still and our body is comfortable and we're not like this all the time. And with mental pliancy, the, the mind is, is tranquil and it can be used in, in various ways. We can place our concentration how we want it, okay? Then pliancy is the proximate cause for bliss, okay? So remember last time we said that joy was a mental factor in the miscellaneous factors aggregate, and bliss is a type of pleasant feeling, okay? So um, the bliss here refers to the bliss uh, in the access stage. Uh, so one has not yet entered a dhyana, but one is in the uh, preparation stage, yeah, which has many stages within itself. I'm not going to go into all of that here. It comes in in volume four. Okay, so uh, the bliss is the proximate cause for concentration. Uh, and from gaining deeper and deeper concentration, then we can go up the, the four dhyanas and then into the four formless realm concentrations. The four formless realm concentrations are good for m- making the mind very uh, flexible in terms of different uh, states of and depths of of concentration. But the formless realm absorptions are too um, abstract, too too focused, yeah. And so they're not very good for developing wisdom, yeah. The dhyanas and the form realm are much better for that. Okay, then the seventh, so those were the first six points, reviewing those. Then the seventh one is concentration is the proximate cause for knowledge and vision of things as they really are. So that's where I left off reading last time. Okay, so although it is an important precursor for wisdom, concentration alone is not sufficient to free us from cyclic existence. Okay, Um, despite its bliss and tranquility, concentration has only suppressed the coarse defilements. Okay, so here you can see part of the benefit of developing these deep states of samadhi is that the coarse afflictions and defilements have been temporarily suppressed. They haven't been cut from the root. They haven't been eradicated. And the deeper levels of the afflictions have not been touched. 
just by concentration. Okay. So other defilements still remain in the mind, dormant, and ready to spring up whenever conditions allow. As we all know, when our afflictions just pop up seemingly out of nowhere, but they were dormant in the mind for a long time. The ignorance of the four truths that is the root of samsara, as, uh, and this is according to the Pali system, okay, where it's the ignorance of the four truths that is the root of samsara. Yeah, in our system, in the Prasangika system, it's the uh, grasping at inherent existence of persons and phenomena. That's the root of samsara. Okay, but here it's the four truths, because this is a Pali tradition description here. Okay, so the ignorance of the four truths, it is the root of samsara, as well as other pollutants and fetters that depend on it, must still be abandoned. To do this, insight and wisdom are essential. So now concentration is used to generate knowledge and vision of things as they really are. Okay, which is a form of insight that knows and sees the five aggregates as they actually are. And what's it seeing particularly in the five aggregates? Their nature, their arising, and their passing away. Okay, and these are, are very important things to, to understand because without understanding these, um, we, we relate to people and things in a totally upside down way. Yeah, because we think that there's something that they're not. A mind in which the hindrances have been suppressed through concentration is needed to be able to see reality clearly. So that's why the concentration is important. Just as a woodcutter needs not only a sharp axe, but also clear eyesight so he can st uh, strike the same point repeatedly and fell the tree. Similarly, meditators require steadiness and clear the require the steadiness and clarity that concentration provides to direct their wisdom to the analysis of conditioned phenomena. Okay, so that's how we use the concentration. The knowledge and vision of things as they really are liberates us. Okay, and the Buddha said, the destruction of the pollutants is for one who knows and sees. Okay, here pollutants are one type of uh, defilement, okay? There's different ways to uh, categorize the defilements and the pollutants are one way. So the destruction of the pollutants is for one who sees and knows, I say, not for one who does not know and does not see, okay? So see, by the way, yeah, is the word apasana, so we get vipassana, meaning like exceptional seeing, which we usually translate as insight. Okay. Knowledge and vision are not intellectual, but are a knowing and seeing that are so vivid that it is as if we were perceiving something with our eyes. So with your mental consciousness, you know the object so well and so clearly that it feels like you're actually seeing it with your senses. It's initial. It uh, here means knowledge and vision of things as they are. Its initial cultivation may depend on conceptual knowledge, which helps to dispel mistaken notions. However, once the coarse misconceptions are dispelled and right view is established, we must go beyond conceptual knowledge to affect the very deep changes that lead us to liberation. Okay, so here, some people make a mistake, you know, and they think that the way, the path to liberation means uh, not thinking anything. Yeah, to getting rid of all the thoughts in your mind. 
And this comes not only from sophisticated uh, religious systems, but from the New Age apps and the New Age, you know, uh, meditation that, that they teach you for $99.99, okay, special price for you. Um, and, and so people begin to think, okay, meditation, the goal of meditation is not to think anything, to get rid of all thoughts. And people think, oh, that's that sounds good, because they realize that their thoughts are so often filled with garbage and hate and criticism and desire and greediness. And so they think, great, if I can get rid of all these thoughts, you know, especially like you hold gudras against people that you for something they did 40 years ago, um, you know, you begin to think, oh, it'd be really good not to have thoughts. Then my mind would be really peaceful. I could see things clearly. So I just want to subdue all the thoughts together. Okay. And they think, oh, well, thinking about uh, the, the nature um, arising and passing away of phenomena, that's thinking, that's thoughts. I can't do it, okay? Thinking about how things exist, thinking about impermanence, analyzing if samsara has the nature of being dukkha, unsatisfactory, all that involves thought, so I just need to cancel all of that too. So all my analytical meditation, I'm stopping, uh, you know, I'm. I just want kind of this open blank mind. It sounds good. You know, when your mind's like, you know, having an open blank mind, oh, what relief. However, yeah, not thinking is not concentration, and not thinking is not the path to awakening, okay? Now, I know in India they say, well, okay, put it this way. In in India, the cows wander around the street. I don't think those cows think very much, okay? And in fact, in India, they're called holy cows, you know, and they're regarded as holy. But they don't think very much. Do you think being a cow is a stage on the path to liberation? Yeah, do you think it's a desirable rebirth that you would want to have? Uh, you don't think very much, you know. I don't think cows hold grudges for, you know, 30 years. Uh, human beings do. So we see that just having a blank mind is not the goal of, of a spiritual path or of meditation. Okay, we, we want to gain wisdom, and to gain wisdom, we start out by learning. And whatever we learn, uh, from a teacher at least, is uh, through words and language. Yeah, I mean, our whole school system, our educational system, is all about learning words and languages uh, to describe phenomena so we can understand how they interrelate and affect each other. Okay? If you want to teach somebody the Dharma, you need words and language. Yeah? Yeah. Otherwise, you go. And somebody's supposed to understand that? Yeah? Uh, okay. So it's, it's very important. We, we want to subdue the very gross kind of uh, conceptual thoughts that are the ones that are affected by pollutants and, and uh, afflictions and so forth. But we just want to quiet them so that we can develop actual concentration that can actually know and see things as they are. Okay, with direct experience. Okay, so to continue on from this, 
you're talking about knowledge and vision of things as they are. Since all, since all our experiences consist of a combination of the five aggregates, essential to the cultivation of wisdom are mindfulness and introspective awareness placed on the five aggregates. Okay, so mindfulness uh, remembers the object that we're putting our focus on, yeah, and introspective awareness monitors the mind to make sure that we're focusing on what we want to focus on. Okay. Although every experience and cognition can be broken down into the five aggregates, our ignorant, non-analytical mind takes the five aggregates as a uniform whole. Okay, so the five aggregates are the components that make up li uh, living beings, um, some living beings have four aggregates, but we all have five. Okay, so the body, called form, feeling, discrimination, miscellaneous factors, and then consciousness. The last four are all mind. They're included in mind. And the first one, form, is, is physical, the body. Okay, so we need to have mindfulness and introspective awareness about our own five aggregates. Okay, so, um, but it's saying here that instead of seeing our five aggregates as something, uh, as separate things, we put them all together, you know, and we see it as one block. Uh -huh. So if, when you look at one of the people here, you have, you see their body, you may hear their voice, you have some feeling about their mood or what's going on in their mind. It's clear they have consciousness. But you see them, you put all those things together and say, oh, there's a person there. But you don't just leave it as, oh, there's a person there. You make it into a substantially existent person. Okay, a real person. Yeah, the real me that's in there. Yeah, so some people may think of it as a self with a capital S or as a soul, you know, or as something that is just plain old me. I am one, unif you know, thing, and this is who I am. Yeah, do you have that feeling? Yeah. I'm not different parts put together. I am one thing who's in charge. Okay. So that leads uh, us to the view that there is a permanent substantial self. This view of a personal identity as being a self is the outer shell surrounding ignorance, and to eliminate it, we must continually break our experience down into the five aggregates, see their nature, their arising, and their passing away. So what does that mean, to break our experience down into the five aggregates? You know, to sit here and say, okay, I'm going to be mindful of my body and you know, be aware of what the body is. You know, it's composed of different parts. It's material in nature. It isn't the most pleasant thing to look at and smell, especially on the inside. Yeah. It's kind of difficult to live in, isn't it? Yeah, aches and pains and diseases and everything else. So we become familiar with that of all part of my experience. That's the body. Then there's the aggregate of feelings. You become aware there. Oh, I do have happy feelings. I do have unhappy feelings. I do have neutral feelings. Yeah. And then you become aware of how the body can cause feelings, and how 
when you have different feelings, then you start discriminating them, you know, and you start preferring some feelings to others. Yeah, I want the happy ones. I don't want the unhappy ones. Okay, so you start discriminating. Then you get into all these miscellaneous factors, which include virtuous ones as well as non-virtuous ones. So usually, yeah, uh, when we have unpleasant feelings, anger and aversion arises. And so that leads to non-virtuous, you know, men- those are non-virtuous mental factors. When we become attached to things, that brings a happy feeling, but we get attached to it. We get greedy about it. We want more and better. That also is a non-virtuous mind. So we have to be careful about how we react to both happy, you know, pleasant, happy feelings and unhappy, unpleasant feelings, as well as the neutral ones. Okay, because that will influence whether we create virtue or non-virtue. Okay, and then consciousness refers to the different kinds of consciousnesses we have. The I, the visual consciousness, auditory, olfactory, gustatory, tactile, and then the mental consciousness. So, you know, if you sit there and you look at each one of the aggregates, you can see that it's different, and you can see how they affect each other, okay? But when we aren't aware of that, then we just grab, grasp it as one thing, like a substantially existent person. Okay. So a very peaceful and concentrated mind has difficulty in engaging in the intense analysis that is now required. Because to really look at the five aggregates in depth, you need to, you need the concentration, but you need, the, you know, the intensity of the analysis. Yeah. Thus the meditator emerges from the deep concentration of a dhyana and studies each factor of that dhyanic state, identifying it as one of the five aggregates. So I find this very interesting. When you're cultivating serenity, you're completely, uh, you know, in that state of mind. But to develop wisdom, you come out of the one of the dhyanas, and you look back at that state of the dhyanic state of mind and you understand what was, uh, what was your body in that state of mind? What are the feelings? What are the discrimination? What other miscellaneous factors arise? What were all your consciousnesses doing? Okay. So it's turning. You had this blissful concentration and now you're coming out of it and turning back and really analyzing it. Okay, to understand its innate, its nature, its arising and its passing away. Okay, then the meditator examines the causes and conditions giving rise to each factor and each aggregate. Okay, so here you're really going into when you hear the the uh, four establishments of mindfulness. This is the kind of thing you're going into. Yeah. So this, this is real Buddhist mindfulness. The mindfulness on your app is, um, that's secular mindfulness. <laughs> that's just, you know, being aware of what's happening. Here we're talking uh, that real mindfulness has a factor of investigation or analysis that's really probing and trying to understand. So this brings awareness, when we do this, of the five aggregates that are part of the, that dhyanic state. This brings awareness that there is simply an ever-changing flow of physical and mental events that is devoid of a controlling self. Wow! 
when you pay attention to each aggregate, you see each aggregate is changing on a momentary basis, never remaining the same. And that, you know, what you're calling I is just this conglomeration of all these changing aggregates. And there's no real self in there. In other words, you aren't who you think you are. Yeah. And some religions try and help you discover who you really are. Buddhism helps you discover who you aren't. Because we have tons of wrong views about who we are. Okay? And those views limit us and confine us and make us suffer. Okay, so there's simply an ever-changing flow of physical and mental events that is devoid of a controlling self. So this self that we feel, you know, I'm here, I'm controlling the situation, I'm directing this, at least I can direct my body, I can direct my mind. So we think, but actually we don't very well. And of course I want to control other people, yeah, so this is this is the I that that uh, yeah the control freak I okay that meets uh, with a lot of frustration yeah when we start trying to control other people doesn't work okay so the meditator understands conditionality because each event arises when its causes and conditions exist, and each event ceases when its causes and conditions cease. Yeah. And it sounds, we read this, and it sounds, well, yes, of course. Like, this is nothing new. But the way we live our life, we block all this out. Yeah. We, you know, it says... Each, each event exists because the causes and conditions for it exist, okay? The political, present political turmoil in this country, does it exist without causes and conditions? No, there's many causes and conditions, yeah? When those causes and conditions change, will the dynamics in the country change? Yes. If those causes and conditions are overcome, then a lot of the turbulence in society can be overcome, okay? So just seeing that everything we experience, it doesn't come out of nowhere, okay? Which, you know, so much in our lives, we, we act towards like it just came out of nowhere, yeah? When we have a bad experience, why do, why does this happen to me? Yeah, we're so shocked. Why does this happen to me? What did I do to deserve this? That's what my mother used to say when she was mad at me. What did I do to deserve a kid like you? Well, I don't know, Mom. That was your business. <laughs> you know? <laughs> but, uh, yeah. So we we think as if harm just comes out totally unexpectedly out of nowhere, which it doesn't, you know, it comes from causes and conditions. But when we're happy, we never say, what did I do to deserve this? We say, give me more. Yeah, and we don't think our happiness depends on creating the causes which you know, when we understand karma, the causes of happiness are virtue. Yeah? Not convincing other, not bri bribing other people or uh, bribing your mi mice with cheese so that they will tell their friends not to eat the offerings on your altar. Okay? That, that, that's not the cause of, of uh, happiness. Okay, so, oops. so none of these factors or aggregates exist on their own independently 
and none of them require a supervisory self to function. So there's this sense, you know, of the the self-sufficient self, that there's a supervisor, you know, there's a me that supervises the whole thing. Yeah, don't you feel that way? There's a me that kind of looks over with says, okay, body, this is what you're doing. Okay, mind, this is what you're doing. You know, I'm controlling you. You need to do what I say because I'm the supervisor. Okay, and we really believe that that kind of self exists because we fear if it didn't exist, there would be nothing holding the aggregates together and there would be no person at all. You know, if there's not some self there that's in charge, then, you know, then there's nobody there. And uh, we don't want to think that there's nobody there. Okay. Then this is why we, you know, people hear, oh, Buddhism says no self. Yeah. So isn't that the goal? You're supposed to realize that there's no person there? There's no self? No, that's a misunderstanding of what no self means. Okay? There's a certain kind of self that we think we have that we don't have. That's the self that is no self. But there is a self on the conventional level because... uh, We each have a name. We say I and you and he and she and they and, you know, we call people by their names. We know what they are. There's a self there, but it's not the kind of self that we grasp at, you know, this one that is one thing, controlling, supervisory, independent. Okay, that's the one that's no self. There is conventionally a self that exists. But when you try and find out what exactly that self is, you can't identify anything. But that doesn't mean it doesn't exist. We'll get into that more later. Okay, this awareness of conditionality leads to the examination of the rising and passing away of each physical and mental event, noticing the coming into existence and the vanishing from existence of forms, feelings, discriminations, miscellaneous factors, and consciousnesses reveals their impermanence. They not only arise and cease due to conditions, but conditions cause them to arise and cease in each nanosection, second, nanosecond. And even each nanosecond of a nanosecond, you can't find the smallest unit of time when you search for it. Okay. But everything exists because the causes is, for it exist, including us. And everything ceases when the cause for it to exist cease. Yeah. Do you feel like you're something that exists only because the causes and conditions for you exist? No, we don't feel that way, do we? We don't feel like, oh, there's just a bunch of causes and conditions that came together. We feel me. You know, I am one unified, independent thing. I don't depend on any causes and conditions. Yeah, they can't destroy me. Check up. When they cease, you cease. Okay? So this whole way we grasp ourselves is completely wrong. Changing in every brief moment, the five aggregates are unsatisfactory because they are incapable of bringing us stable happiness. So understanding impermanence and the constant change, things go under, under, uh, things have, have happened to them. 
simply because they exist. Yeah, there's no outside factor that necessarily causes things to change. It's their very nature, yeah, to change. So changing, when we realize that things change that quickly, then what is it that we can find that's going to bring us lasting happiness? A happiness that is not going to change, that isn't going to degenerate, because everything's changing. So we can't find, you know, that kind of permanent security that we want, the permanent happiness, the permanent safety, okay? We can't find that because it depends on causes and conditions that are always changing. Okay? So that makes the, the five aggregates unsatisfactory. So when we talk about the three characteristics of conditioned phenomena, the first one is impermanence. They're changing so swiftly. The second one is dukkha, that by their nature they are unsatisfactory. And we can look in our lives. We've all had lots of happiness from different things, but none of it has lasted, has it? Yeah, you experience happiness and you wait a while and it's gone. What's interesting is we expect the happiness never to degenerate. And also when we have pain, we expect the pain to continue ad infinitum, as if the, you know, the pain is never going to change. And that also is wrong. Or we look at ourselves and we say, I am deficient, so I'm always going to be deficient. Or I'm an angry person, I'm always going to be an angry person, you know, like that. And thinking then, oh, well, the path is totally hopeless. You know, I can't progress because this is the kind of person I am and I'm not going to change. Okay? So this is why understanding impermanence is important because it, it loosens, it shakes up a lot of our reified ideas about who we are and about what happiness is and about what the, the purpose of our life is. So the clear seeing of the three characteristics of conditioned phenomena, impermanence, dukkha, and no self. Yeah, seeing that very clearly is the knowledge and vision of things as they really are. So you can see, yeah, we spent a long time on this particular link, but you can see that having developed ethical conduct and then concentration, now you're starting to generate wisdom and developing insight, and you can see things as they really are. In, in this sense, as being impermanent, the nature of dukkha and uh, not self. Hmm? Okay, then the eighth link is knowledge and vision of things as they really are is the proximate cause for disenchantment. Okay, so knowledge and vision of things as they really are is a weak insight. So we have some insight, but it's not, it's weak. Okay, disenchantment is strong insight. To progress from the former to the latter, a meditator now focuses his attention on the momentary passing away of the aggregates, their disintegration and cessation. So here, that, so they're focusing on really one-pointed, changing, changing, going out of existence, disintegrating. Yeah. Repeated mindfulness on the vanishing of what he thinks is the source of happiness and security, sparks disenchantment and disappointment. Okay? 
So dis- disenchantment. I think we've all felt disenchantment before in an ordinary way. Yeah? You have some situation that is like, wow, this is fantastic. This is great. This is really together, and I'm really going to enjoy it, and I'm going to have happiness, and it's everything's going to go perfectly. And then time passes, and you're restless, and you're fed up, and uh, wait, this isn't what I thought it was supposed to be. This car was advertised to be like this, and it's turning out to be like that. Okay, this person said they would love me forever, and now they're off with somebody else. Yeah. So you get disenchanted. Yeah. In other words, we built up this false conception of something, this expectation, and now we're confronting it uh, in the reality of it, that it's impermanent, unsatisfactory by nature, and there's no solid self in there. Okay. Okay. The things that he believed, that the, the things that the meditator believed would protect him and bring him joy are now seen as they are, for farces and deceptions. And the mind wisely it turns away from them. Okay? If, if you bought some snake oil and you were taking the snake oil and thinking that it was going to cure you of all your suffering, and then you kind of woke up and thought, no, it's snake oil, um, you're going to be disenchanted, aren't you? And you're going to say, you know, this is true deception. This is d- d- totally fooled me. Yeah, and I don't need this anymore. I'm done with it. Yeah, take the snake oil. Okay. So the mind wisely turns away from them. So this is the way it is in samsara. Instead of clinging to the desirable objects of samsara, we say, you know, like, huh? You really think I'm going to get ultimate pleasure out of this? Forget it. That's not going to bring me what I want. And you turn away. This process of disenchantment is similar to that of a child who realizes without a doubt that Santa Claus does not exist and stops waiting for Santa to come on Christmas Eve. Okay? So you were sure Santa Claus existed and you were going to stay up late and watch him come down that chimney and then you realize there's no Santa. All these adults around you who tell you to tell the truth are were lying to you. Yeah. To kids, you know, kids are smart. And, you know, oh, they tell me to tell the truth. But they told me there was Santa and there was the tooth fairy and, you know, and there was the boogeyman and I believe them. Uh, so, child's disenchanted. So it's the same way with us, you know, samsara kept presenting us with all these things, you know, that we could have joy and happiness and excitement and adventure from, okay? You know, you could go in the wilderness at the base of a glacier and an avalanche could cover you. This just happened in in Alaska. And you come out alive. Yeah, what excitement must thrill. I survived a glacial avalanche. Well, if you get your highs that way, okay. But, um, you know, is that really going to bring you lots of happiness? Well, I can go on my yacht or my sailboat. I can go sailing around and the breeze in my face feels so good. Yeah. In 
<laughs> till the boat breaks. You know, you run into something else or it springs a leak or the wind is bad or you're caught in a storm or who knows what. Okay. So disenchantment is not depressing. Yeah, it's not like, oh, I'm so depressed. These things aren't what I thought they were. It's, it's a soberness. Yeah, is there such a word as soberness? You're becoming sober. You know, it's like, oh, this is it. You're seeing something clearly without all the decorations and exaggerations that, that you had on it before. So it's not depressing. It's like, oh, now I understand why things didn't turn out the way I wanted them to. So uh, disenchantment is not depressing. It is simply losing interest in the transient, unsatisfactory, and selfless external world with its colloidal scope of illusory, sensual delights that leave us exhausted. It's true, isn't it? Yeah. Do you come back from Disneyland invigorated and full of life? No, you're exhausted. You go on vacation. Do you come back invigorated? No, you're exhausted from going here and there and doing this and that. Yeah, you have to go home to relax after your vacation. <laughs> yeah. So we now turn inward to wisdom. So we're saying all that stuff going on out there, yeah, it's not going to bring me ideal happiness. I want to go inside and really discover the truth, the nature of things. So the meditator realizes that until now, he has filtered and evaluated every experience through the distorted lens of mine, I, and myself. So every experience we have is filtered through that. Yeah, through mine. How does it influence what I have? Through I, through myself. Yeah, my happiness, my well-being, my feeling good about myself, yeah, my reputation, my approval ratings. You know, everything is, is seen through that. And there's this universe with how many gazillions of sentient beings in it, and we see everything through the lens of my, mine, I, and myself. Whereas he previously believed but that this was the truth, that seeing things through mine, I, and myself was accurate, the meditator now sees mine, I, and myself are conceptual fabrications imputed by ignorance, and they know without a doubt that believing them to be true is the source of dukkha. Okay. So how are notions of mine, I, and myself fabricated imputations? Okay. When we say, this is mine, okay, so something that I hold precious. Kleenex! Kleenex are very important in this world, you know. Without Kleenex, you've had it. And Kleenex, in many circumstances, is more important than money. Yeah? So this precious Kleenex is mine. Okay, what, I just said, this is mine. What about this is mine? What makes this mine? Is the box mine? 
is there something in the box that is mine? There's mindness in the box. Is there mindness in this tissue? You might say, well, not when it's clean. I can use it. But when I've used it, then you think, oh, it's yours. <laughs> yeah. But is there anything in the tissue that is either mine or yours? You know, can you find something in it that indicates mine? Yeah. What about your car? My car, my reputation, uh, my bank account, my mortgage, my student loan debt, my, my, my. Is there anything mine about any of those things? What makes something mine? This is a really interesting question to sit with because we use the words my and mine a lot. But what makes something mine? Yeah, my hair. Well, what about the hair makes it mine? What is mine anyway? Yeah, it's mine. What in the world is mine? Where do I find mine? Okay. So we start really examining these kinds of things. Yeah, and it, it is quite eye-opening. Yeah. So the meditator now knows without a doubt that believing these things, mine, I, and myself, to be the source of, uh, to be true, that that belief is the source of dukkha. Okay. He knows the aggregates are not mine. What do you mean my body isn't mine? My body is mine. What about the body makes it yours? What is yours? Who is the owner of this body? Yeah. So they know that the aggregates are not mine. These are not, uh, these I am not. So my body is not me either. It's not mine and it's not me. And these are not myself. Yeah, my body isn't myself. The meditator knows these, and he begins to mentally set down the burden that was never his to begin with. This is the whole tragedy of, of cyclic existence, is that we were believing in false things all along. Yeah. It wasn't like there's some external being or some demon or something like that that's doing something to us. But it's just our wrong conceptions that have kept us uh, trapped, you know, that we didn't need to have, but we kept following them and believing them. So here the Buddha says, therefore monastics, any kind of form whatsoever any kind of feeling whatsoever, any kind of discrimination whatsoever, any kind of miscellaneous factor whatsoever, any kind of consciousness whatsoever, whether past, present, uh, past, future, or present, internal or external, coarse or subtle, inferior or superior, far or near, yeah, all these aggregates and all these different situations should be seen as they really are with correct wisdom. This is not mine. This I am not. This is not myself. Okay, so that's our job. Seeing this, monastics, 
the instructed Arya disciple experiences disenchantment towards form, feeling, discrimination, miscellaneous factors, and consciousness. Experiencing dis disenchantment, he becomes dispassionate. He stops chasing it. Through dispassion, his mind is liberated. When it is liberated, there comes the knowledge it is liberated. He understands birth is destroyed. The holy life has been lived. What had to be done has been done. There is no more coming to any state of being. So that is a very, very common passage in the Pali Suttas. And that's the what arhats say when they attain the state of arhatship. Okay? So birth is destroyed means birth in samsara is destroyed. The holy life has been lived. Now, why they ordained, they, they've lived it and accomplished the purpose. What had to be done has been done. So liberating oneself has been accomplished. There is no more coming to any state of being, being in samsara. Okay. Some people take that literally, meaning that there's no more state of being whatsoever, but it means being in samsara. So here we see the progression that outlines the, uh, the uh, upcoming steps of dispassion, liberation, and knowledge of destruction. Okay, so then the point nine, Disenchantment is the proximate cause for dispassion. Disenchantment with con conditioned phenomena results from understanding their nature. It is based on accurate knowledge and insight and is not emotional rejection, fear, or escapism. This is important, you know. It's not emotional, oh, I can't stand this. It's not fear, like, oh, I'm panicked. And it's not just rejection because you want to escape something. You don't want to look at it. Okay? Rather, you have confidence and courage, and you are able to look at things as they are. So with disenchantment, oh, understanding the condition uh, prepares us to realize the unconditioned. Yeah, this comes in Prasangika too. With uh, enchantment, a meditator detaches herself from conditioned phenomena. So detach yourself doesn't mean that, you know, you untie the knots and, and take off the snaps and things like that. It means mentally you are, uh, you're freeing yourself from that kind of clinging with knowledge that there is not an actual state of lasting happiness in samsara that can be attained. She is determined to, no, sorry, with, with, with knowledge, not without knowledge, with knowledge that there is an actual state of lasting happiness, nirvana, that can be attained, she is determined to attain it. So you see that there's no happiness in samsara to attain, but there is the happiness in nirvana, and so aspiring for that. She continues relinquishing craving and clinging to condition things and does not take up any new attachments. This process of mental spring cleaning sees the gratification and danger of conditioned things and now seeks an escape, a path to freedom from them. So here's some more words you find a lot in uh, gratification, danger, and escape. Okay, so we begin to see the gratification of chasing uh, impermanent things that are by nature unsatisfactory. We get, you know, the kind of ha a happiness that a mouse gets from just clicking, 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 and every once in a while getting a grain of rice. Okay? So, uh, you know, the, the, the person feels that that kind of gratification 
uh, it doesn't cut it. And it's dangerous because it keeps me clicking at that link, you know, thinking I'm going to get the grain of rice. And it keeps you in Vegas pulling the arm of one, the one handed bandit, thinking that you're going to get a flood of quarters. Whoopee. <laughs> okay. So it's, we see the gratification and danger of conditioned things and now ski, seek an escape. And here escape means a path to freedom. So it doesn't mean escapism because you want to, uh, ignore something. It means you want to really face it and be free of it. Okay, so it seeks uh, escape, a path to freedom from these things. Insight becomes deeper and more penetrative until a breakthrough is reached and she sees nirvana. This is dispassion. Okay, so this is the actual dispassion. And it's a path wisdom. So it's a wisdom of the path that is the first supramundane factor in transcendental dependent arising. So supramundane has to do with seeing reality as it actually is. So this is the first factor where on an ultimate level, seeing the actual nature of something as it is, is realized. While the eight previous factors are called members of transcendental dependent arising, they are in fact still mundane because their objects are conditioned phenomena, in particular the five aggregates. While these factors are indispensable steps to arrive at the supermundane path, they themselves are not supermundane. Okay, so before we have realized selflessness directly, then everything before that is mundane. It may be leading you towards that realization of selflessness, but it is not the insight and the wisdom that are required to have the effect of removing pollutants and afflictions and so on. So let's stop here. Maybe there's some questions or comments. I have a little confusion that goes back to a sentence that, I don't know what page is on, I copied it out, but it says, uh, a med the meditator, this brings awareness that the, no, no, no. Oh, God. Here it is. Knowledge and vision are not intellectual, but are knowing and seeing that are so vivid that it is as if we were perceiving something with our eyes. Mm -hmm. So thinking that this is coming from the Pali tradition, what I got confused about is what is the object of that statement what is it that, that what's it's like a it's, mental it's a mental, a mental direct perceiver yeah. of something but it can't be em selflessness or emptiness directly right because it's poly well do, do um, you understand what it, the confusion uh, yeah i don't know how if the vipassika view or satantrika view matches the poly things exactly okay so then the very last thing that that bit so let me follow this then the very last thing where it also says that then we're um actually seeing the nature of things it's not this thing that comes from the tenets that thinks that they're having this realization only implicitly this is saying that they're actually seeing it yeah okay that, that it's as vivid as as if they were seeing it with their yeah. eyes Okay, cool. Okay, which section is that in? I just want to check. Um, the first, the first thing quoted was under knowledge and vision. Okay, what page? And uh, it's number seven, page, page two forty three. Mm -hmm. Last paragraph. Yeah, I found it. Yeah, 
but it says its initial cultivation may depend on conceptual knowledge, which helps to dispel mistaken notions. However, once the coarse misconceptions are dispelled and right view is established, we must go beyond conceptual knowledge to affect the very deep changes that lead to liberation. Yeah. So yeah. it sounded like Prasangika to me, which sounded really familiar. But I <laughs> Yeah, it starts out with conceptual understanding, and then you go to non-conceptual understanding. Okay. Just a comment. Um, looking at all the times in which we have not been disenchanted, and when we finally realize that Santa doesn't exist, and that there is this whole concept that realizing that finally that we see the truth, I the the thing that came up in my head was no wonder we believe lies, you know. There's something about <laughs> samsara that makes us so gullible to the falsities. As long as it reifies this mind, this myself, this I, we are so gullible. Yep. To anything that reifies and exhilarates it and. And so this this whole disenchantment has a is really got me curious and inspired mm -hmm. to see what that might be. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh huh. On the top of page two forty five, it's talking about the meditator now focuses his attention on the momentary passing away of the aggregates, their disintegration and cessation. Mm -hmm. Is that something that can be done by an ordinary? Mind, or do you have to have realized impermanence for that to really? Again, you start out with a conceptual mind, with the mind you have, and then, you know, gradually the concentration becomes deeper and the wisdom grows, and then the con con conceptual part of it fades away. Yeah, we've got to start with the mind we have. There's, there's no other way. Could you give an example then of how that could be done? Well, whatever your daily meditation practice is. When you do a long meditation, you're going through the points, you're understanding the points, you're gaining some understanding. But every time you do it and you look at it, the topic from different ways, you understand something different, something you didn't understand before. So you keep at it. Does that make sense? I'll think about it. Okay. I don't know how else to explain it. There's uh, no fast track. Okay. Let's dedicate then. <laughs> <laughs>